We are live. We're I'm back. Gonna try to go live over here on. So I have Instagram over here, and I want to make sure that we're live on Instagram as well. And it looks like we are. That's exciting. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I see some people have already joined us, and we're saying hi on YouTube. So thrilled that some people are already joining us. We've got some people joining us on Instagram already. So the only place I'm not sure, I haven't seen any comments from Facebook yet, but we'll manage it. Thank yeah. you so much, everybody, for joining Jason and me for another live. This what I would love to know, for those of you, somebody maybe do a thumbs up if you attended our first live. I'm just really curious who attended our first live. I'm going to watch those comments go through. Actually, just trying to kill a little bit of time, give people a few minutes to hop on. We actually have quite a few are hopping on over on Instagram. I'm sure some of them are just curious when the live thing pops up. What's yeah. this? Yeah. <laughs> Deb. Yep. I see your thumbs up, Deb. Classy, sassy mains. You were there, Judy. Thank you for the thumbs up, you guys. It's so helpful to know. I've All right. So yeah. for those of you who don't know, I'm going to introduce... Uh, Jason Archer, he is the author of the book Wig Life. This is going to be backwards for you guys, but the book Wig Life, many of you have heard of this book because I talk about it all the time. And so do a lot of other um, wig reviewers because it is just such an incredible textbook with tons of information. It's not just a fluff piece, but it's really substantial information that will help you be successful on your wig wearing journey and teaches so many things that even I didn't know. And while in this discussion, we will talk about a few of the things in that book just to give you a flavor of kind of what's in there and if it will help you. And what I really love, and Jason, I want to thank you so much for this, is that you talk about both human hair and synthetic wigs. It seems like in the wig world, it's either human hair or yes. it's synthetic, but very few have expertise in both. Can you just maybe share with us a little bit how you got even into curiosity about synthetics? Yeah, sure. When I started... Um making wigs, when I started taking classes on making wigs, I was just using uh, human hair. I didn't really know anything about um, synthetic at all. And for years, that's all I, I work with. My sister, MJ, she likes synthetic wigs and um, and she likes, she likes how lightweight they are and how easy they are for styling. You know, you put some curls in a synthetic wig and it's going to be there every day. Yes. You're yes. not going to have to pull out a, a um, curling iron the next day. So that's great, especially if there's moisture. Like we're from Georgia where it's pretty humid. <clears throat> so um, we're, we're both in the mountains now. I'm in uh, Asheville and she's in Knoxville, Tennessee. So, um, but still humidity. Uh, so she really encouraged me, you should, you should make some synthetic wigs. We need to do a synthetic collection for when we launch Magnolia J. So that got me interested and it was it was quite a learning curve i had a lot of a lot of homework to do but, yeah uh, but it was a lot of fun and now i like both just as much that's wonderful and so a lot of the women who follow me i would say the vast majority um either currently wear synthetic or got their start with synthetic like i did yeah. because for the first three years i only wore synthetic and I was afraid of human hair. I thought it was going to be a lot harder. I had the impression that you had to style it every time you wore it, just like your bio hair. There was just a lot of misinformation, if you will, about mm -hmm. the whole journey yeah. and even heat friendly synthetic wigs. And so before we kind of get into the reason why we're talking, I thought it could be a good idea to talk a little bit about um, so you have a whole chapter on care and you do talk about synthetic wigs. Yeah, so, we got into some of that last time with yeah. tips on how to make synthetic hair last longer. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. I've gotten so many great messages from, from people since that live and from people who bought the book. Um, a, a lot of your followers have had great conversations. I've had great conversations with them, and it's been a lot of fun to get to know some of you guys. Yeah, and I see a ton of people. I know you can't see the comments, but I do see a lot of people saying, Jason, I just got your book. I bought the book. Um, Vicki said she bought two, one for me and one for my oh, sister. So beautiful. I think there are Thank just you. a lot of people Appreciate really it. benefiting from this. And for those of you on Instagram, just so that you know, the way that the format of these videos has to be for YouTube makes it a little inconvenient on Instagram. So if you're not liking that we're really small on the screen, pop mm. over to YouTube, just search Denise Sheets on YouTube and you can watch us on YouTube and then it will fill your screen. I think that's the one negative of going live on all the platforms. <laughs> 
All right. So why I wanted to get you on here and yes. kind of the meat of this topic is I, the wig I have on my head right now, this yeah. is Danity from In Vogue Medical Wigs and Beyond. This is a human hair wig and my German Shepherd puppy got a hold of it and tore the lace tore a hole in the very top of the lace. <laughs> and I was so sad because I love this wig so much. And I posted it on Instagram, just sort of, oh my gosh, look what happened. Yeah, yeah. And Jason responded and basically messaged me and said, I can fix that. Yeah. And so I sent you this wig and you repaired it. And I thought it would help everybody to talk a little bit about that whole process. And sure. if you have human hair wigs, and something happens to it or it's getting old and, you know, maybe getting bald spots or, or whatever can happen over time. It's not the end of the world and it's not the end of that wig necessarily. So talk a little bit about. Sure. Uh, that was a refronting procedure. Some people call that a lace extension, but I, I like refronting because we're not extending. We're replacing the front yes. panel of lace. So you see that zigzag line. That's a seam. That's called a flat seam. And that's where the new lace was um, stitched in. You use a ventilating needle, the same needle that you put hair into a wig you use to sew. And uh, wig makers call that whipping. And so um, I whipped in a new um, new hairline. And I did it temple to temple. So you can see my hand stitches on the ear tabs. Those are hand stitches right there. Uh, and then just you you harvest some hair from the back of the wig. Most wigs have plenty of hair in the back, especially if it's a wefted wig. Sure. And you probably could never find where I took hair from. I'm very strategic about where it comes from. I put a pin every, every time I take hair, I put a pin so I won't go near that spot again. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, uh, and so just you put in new hair and then uh, new hairline. And, and, and that was fun because I asked you, what kind of hairline would you like? There's three classic hairline shapes that I put into the book. Yeah. And you said, oh, I want this one. And so that was kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and another step you can take with a refronting is uh, sometimes clients would like to replicate their 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 real hairline, their bio hairline. And so it's easy to make a template of your existing hairline if you still have hair. Um, I teach you in chapter six how to chapter seven how to do that, how to make a template of your hairline, and you can just send that, and I can put that into the wig. Um, yeah. So. so so I'm hoping you can all see, depending on the size of your screen, but he was referring to that zigzag where he sewed on the new lace. And then he also put a, do, would you call it a patch? What you put right here where just he- a, Just a, a patch repair, a little, a repaired little hole. Yeah. And so as far as harvesting the hair from the back, mm -hmm. how tedious is that? And about how long would you say it took you to do the lace on this one? It, that one took a little- bit of extra time because that is a six inch wide lace top you know most like standard lace tops are four inch wide but you sure. can see sometimes five and sometimes six so the wider the lace top the more sewing has to be done the more hand stitching has to be done with the ventilating needle so that one took a little extra time um it's a it's a good long project that and reducing the circumference of a wig are probably the, the two most um uh, intense procedures they're like surgeries yeah so um and there's with refronting there's all these pieces of the puzzle that have to be considered like does the wig have a a, a shadow root i just did a refronting and i posted on instagram of a lady who sent me a wig whose the front end was just a mess and um but that wig had a shadow root so if i harvest hair from the back and just ventilate it in the shadow root isn't going to be in the right place anymore yes so i have to go in with some dye and paint in a new shadow root, which that that's just another piece of the puzzle. It's it's fun, but it's a, it can be a lot. I'm sure yeah. it can be. So Sirena, Sinria, I'm not sure how to say your name. She asked, why no Widow's Peak in wigs? Oh, I love to do Widow's Peak. Miss, um, Saint, Miss Denise asked for a hairline that I call the Strad, and it doesn't have a Widow's Peak. But there's another uh, hairline that's pretty classic that has a Widow's Peak. Um, and I call that one the Phoenix. But yeah, um, but yeah you I, can totally do a widow's peak. I wonder if what the prevalence is of widow's peaks in women. Why wigs don't have a widow's peak in general? I think I've seen some human hair wigs that have a little bit of one, but yeah. I'm just wondering if it's because the vast majority of women don't have one, or what that would be. I can uh, make a, a guess, a good guess. Your factory wigs, they like to make a sort of rainbow round hairline shape. They've kind of gotten into the habit of that. And if you add a widow's peak to that shape, 
then cutting the lace can be a little bit of a conundrum because if you were to cut up and around that widow's peak, now you're going to have to use adhesives or the widow's peak is just going to flap around. Right. And so a lot of people don't, don't want to use hit adhesives. So I think that's probably why you don't see a lot of widow's peak in stock wigs. Yeah. But it's easy, that, it's easy to I add. do get that question a fair amount. How, how do I deal with my widow's peak? How do I, I know there's quite a few women who shave their widow's peak just yeah, to yeah. make it easier to wear wigs. But yeah, it's it's easy to so if you get a refronting and you want a widow's peak, that's that's easy to add add to the to the equation. Um, a refronting is really handy for a couple of reasons, uh, for a few reasons. Um, your the front end of your wig is the first thing that's going to go on your wig, especially if you get into really nice fine lace. Yes. That's this could be the limiting factor. Um, but but the hair is usually still really great um, by that time. So it it's almost like it's such a shame to throw away a wig just because the front end is now no right. longer pretty. It'd be like throwing your car away just because it needs new tires, you know? Yeah. So refrontings are a little pricey, but as, as wig repairs go, it's somewhere around $500, depending on all the things like shadows, uh, uh, shadow roots and things like that. But compared to a brand new wig, that's really nice. So, yeah. And you can, you can do it on a synthetic wig. Um, uh, most of my synthetic wigs that I sell, I've had my manufacturer sew part of the cap and do part of the ventilating, and then I refront them because they can't deal with the kind of lace I like. So, but, but the cost of synthetics are so much lower, it's, it's usually better just to buy a brand new Not one. Not worth it, right? Yeah. Or I, I suppose with budget wigs as well, there yeah, are some very budget wigs one. out there, so it might not be worth it to have that done. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the lace. So that was one factor in our last live, or at some point I said how I wasn't super gentle with my lace, so I don't think I really wanted like the super fine film lace because yeah. I figured I'd tear it right away. But yeah. you ended up using coated lace on mine. So talk when about we, that. When we did that live and you said, I don't think I want film lace. I was like, oh gosh, I've already started <laughs> and it's too late now. <laughs> so what do you think about it? Do you like it? I love it. And it doesn't, wow. it doesn't feel super fragile for no. me. When you, when it's coated with something, it's like, oh, ever since they started making coated lace, it was a game changer. Cause like now we, oh, now we can start getting into finer laces with medical clients. It's going to last a lot longer. That coating doesn't add much to the thickness of the lace, but it adds a lot to the rate that the lace frays and okay. um, and how easy it is to tear. So yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So I know that there are some people who purchase a wig and they don't love the lace on the wig. So an option, if it's uh, worth it to them, obviously yeah. financially, is to have the lace replaced yeah. and That's with the lace that they would rather have. That's another common reason to have a refronting. You love the wig, but the lace is a terrible um, co color or it's way too thick. Um, or maybe the factory didn't sew it down tight enough. The, they have some issues with getting that angle right. And so if things are like lifting. And so that's another uh, reason some people will, will want a refronting. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. You've mentioned a couple of times the factory. So I don't think a lot of people realize just how wigs come to be. Yeah. And I know I've mentioned it in the past, you know, a lot of the factories are in China, I'd say the vast majority, but there are some in yeah. other countries. Yeah. But they're good at some things and not great at others. Yeah. And every one of them are different. Um, if, if we didn't have, first of all, if we didn't have these manufacturers, wigs would all be from scratch. And if you've ever bought a wig from scratch, they are very expensive. It takes, it can take months to hand tie everything that needs to be hand tied. And so there are things that wig manufacturers can do that they're really good at. And then there are things that they're not so great at. In general, I find they're, they're, Hair processing is a little harsh. I've been learning hair processing myself so that I can do that piece myself. Um, their hairlines aren't that great, usually. They're all sort of stuck in this one type of knot called a double reverse split knot, which is beautiful, but it's not the best knot for everywhere in the wig. Um, every There's six different kinds of knots and they all look and behave a little differently. Um, but if you've got a factory full of people, it's easy. I guess it's just easier to teach them all the same knot. Sure. But, but that's not the most beautiful knot for the hairline. Um, so the hairlines are, are a bit of an issue with factories. And then lace. If I was to take the lace that I put into your wig and send it to 
the manufacturer that I like, the manufacturer that I use, and said, put this in the front. Um, don't even ventilate it. Just put it in the front. They would tear a hole in it. They're not even ventilating on it. They're not even hand tying on it. And they still make a hole. How does that, how does that work? So I think they're, I suspect they're using T pins. I think they're, and, and those people have to go so fast. They're expected to ventilate really fast. Right. And so that, you know, that lends itself to um, being a little more harsh on the lace. So, but, um, but I don't uh, discredit manufacturers. The things that they can do well is wonderful. Um, I have a manufacturer whose sewing is, um, is amazing. Like my caps, they sew most of my cap and I put in some finishing touches and it's beautiful. I love their sewing. So, and they can do that for a fraction of the cost that I would have to charge if I did it from scratch. Yeah. So I've beautiful. talked to a number of retailers about the process of even finding a vendor that you can trust and the thousands of hours and tens of thousands of dollars it takes to get to the point where you've got a vendor that you can rely on and that will send you con as consistent quality as is yeah. possible with human beings. It can be very frustrating working with a manufacturer. There's quite a, a learning curve and um, building a relationship with one. Um, it took me a good over a year to get where I am with, with one that I'm working with. Yeah. And so I think part of this whole conversation is my goal is that anyone who watches this live can walk away a little bit more knowledgeable about the wig process, about yeah. what can be done with wigs, two wigs, you know, and also have a little, I guess for me, I've gained tremendous respect for retailers like you because I never realized how much risk you take in this industry, working with overseas factories and all of the things that can come with that. So I'm grateful for it. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I learned quite a bit um, over the years working for another um, a brand uh, that, that was very helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a risk, but it's a lot of fun too. Awesome. So I saw a question. Uh, Jolyn Jones said pinked edge or scalloped? Oh, good question. So we I teach you in the chapter one of Wig Life all about trimming wig lace. And you can actually read that for free. The first 15 pages are free. And so you could learn. So I won't spend too much time, but the shape that you cut in a wig lace is important if you're want to be glueless. Now, if you're going to use an adhesive, you could use um, pinking shears or you could do scalloped. You could do whatever you want because that adhesive is going to hold all those little pieces down against the skin. But if you're going to wear your wig glueless, then the edge of that lace is totally dependent on tension to hold it back. Those, those elastics are pulling on the ear tabs and the ear tabs have a hold of the front lace and all of that's getting pulled back. If that edge is scalloped or zigzagged there'll be parts of the lace that won't have access to that tension and so they'll just be hanging there and yeah. so and if your lace lifts away from your skin you'll get a shadow and it'll be easier to see yeah and yeah. i will just add i think synthetic wigs major manufacturers synthetic wigs so john yeah. renault renee of paris all of those major manufacturers they use a different lace than I've experienced on human hair wigs. It's thicker, yeah. it's stiffer, and I have not had any issue cutting that lace with a pinking shears, but the type of lace will matter. How much you wear your wig is probably going to matter. Mm -hmm. I don't wear any one wig a ton, so when I've cut the lace on my major manufacturer synthetics, I'm probably not wearing it half as much as the average wig wearer because I switch my wigs out so much. And so I do think it may lay flat in the beginning, but over time you may find that lifting. Oh, and I think we're going to talk about um, fixing lace that's gotten warped. Yes, yes, we are. I do want to see, I'm, let me get to that, but I want to, I thought I saw another question. Um, so the question was, how do you choose someone to do these things to your wig? So are you asking, like, as a wig wearer, how do you pick the person who's going to work on your wig? Is that your question? I'm not certain if I understand the question, so I'll see if she... And I apologize, you guys. I think I'm getting a cold. I'm starting oh. to get really nasally, and my oh. left eye is watering. So just <laughs> ignore all of that. It's just coming on suddenly. But we'll get through it's this. That, it's that time of year. 
Yeah, I don't know, but I just I started to hear it, and now this eye is starting to water. So we'll see what happens. But I I put as far as wig makers that I know who can do things. Um, I tried to represent as many of those as I could in wig life. So I tried to introduce you to a lot of a lot of different wig makers. I know Gretchen Gretchen, who uh, many of you may know from on Instagram. She's wonderful. Uh, she does refrontings, and I do refrontings as well. So yeah, I'll stuff. have to get that name from you. So I do have a what I call the ultimate resource. Um, my website and I list oh that's wonderful it's a spreadsheet and there's a tab for online retailers there's a tab for in-person wake shops and as I learn about new ones I add them and then I have a tab for of stylists who will work on wigs that's and wonderful. so if anybody knows of one and if you've seen my list it's just on my website heywigsister.com and I would just maybe message me, send me an email to let me know so I can add more people to the list. Cause there aren't a lot of people that I'm aware of who do this. No, wig making can be very tedious. There's quite a, the first year that's like really frustrating. And so um, th there aren't as quite as many wig makers as there should be yeah. for doing things like this, like rock rubber pairs and, um, yeah, and absolutely. New, new hairlines. So before we get to that other topic, I one of the things I thought was interesting about you is that you cut the lace on your clients' wigs before you send them out. And that's very rare. Talk yeah, about that. Yeah, I, I can get away with that because of it being coated lace. If I was to coat a traditional lace, then we may get some fraying just in them trying it on, you know. And then if they wanted to send it back, say, oh, this wasn't quite a good fit for me. Now I've got lace that's frayed. But because I use coated lace, I can get away with trimming it myself for them. So I trimmed your, your, your lace before I sent it us. And, um, and no, it's not that I'm perfect with that or anything, but, um, if I do it myself, then I know this is going to be the rainbow round shape. This is going to be starting them off in the right shape, because if you're going to trim off more, you'll tend to stay with the same shape. So yes. I think it's worth it to my clients to do it for them. But, um, but, but that's a risk that most people won't take. Well, and I do think I've heard from a lot of women, they almost don't want to buy human hair wigs because they don't want to cut the lace. Okay. Coming from synthetic, you don't have to do that. So I think that's kind of a wonderful service. Um, so let's talk about one of the wig sisters who are wig sisters reached out to me. She got your book and she read the section where you talk about how to block the lace uh -huh. that's lifting or, or warped a little bit and it's not laying flat. Yeah. We, we talk about blocking in chapter one, which is the process of um, putting your wig on a wig block and pinning the front lace down with twill tape. That has a lot of advantages for your wig to do that right before you style it or you do any kind of procedure. There's a ton of um, projects in wig life for you to do on your wig and most and a lot of them. There's probably a dozen of them that start with the first step of block your wig. And so that just that protects the lace. And if you're blocking it with twill tape, every time you style it, you're training that lace to stay flat. And we want it to stay flat so that it makes contact with our skin. You can take blocking, and it's not hard. Um, you just need some twill tape, ball head pins, the right size wig block is right. important. You can take blocking a step further and turn that into something that repairs lace. If you have lace that has started to warp and started to wave a little bit. Um, as long as it used to lay flat, if it if it once upon a time laid flat when you first got the wig and now it's warped, there's something called damp blocking that is, it's like magic. I don't, I don't know how it works, but it just does. So you block the wig as usual, but you dampen the twill tape. You drop it in some water, squeeze it out. And then you're gonna pin it over the lace nice and tight. And if you just leave that overnight, nine times out of 10, the, the next morning, the lace will be flat again, like it used to be. It's so weird. I, how does moisture affect plastic? Yeah. Lace? I have yeah. no idea. Well, but, yeah. and I'm sharing this because a wig sister shared with me that she followed the instructions. There's pictures and everything in the book yeah. and it worked like magic and her lace lays flat again. I have no idea how that works. Now, <laughs> if, now if the lace never laid flat to begin with, then it's not, it's not going to help. Right. But, um, but if it, if it, it warped over time, damp blocking is very helpful. Yeah. Can we talk for a moment about fit? So yeah. this wig that I have on mm -hmm. doesn't fit me great. It, and it never has. It's not because yeah. you did anything to it. It just never has fit me quite right. Yeah. And so I struggle with the lace not really laying flat at the edges here. And you mentioned 
that's a really hard place for lace to lay flat. For glueless wigs, that is right. our biggest biggest challenge. Um, unfortunately, most clients aren't, aren't too worried about it because their hair is going to cover that or create right. a shadow. But um, the limiting, it, it affects, okay, so you have these triangles that come out on your your, your temples or your mm -hmm. temple triangles. Well, the further they, we want them to come out a little bit because that looks natural. Right. The more they come out, the harder it is for that area to stay flat because we're, again, we're depending on tension to hold it flat. And it, the further we go out, the further away from the tension of the wig we get. So right. it's just a really common place to find things lifting. And so um, for clients who like really want to wear the hair pulled back away from the face, they might just put just like a little bit of um, temporary adhesive there just to make things nice and, and flat. Yeah, there. That's helpful. Or even I, when I wear a wig, um, my wig doesn't have any boning. I just make a full lace cap and I'll put toupee tape in that area because toupee tape is really easy to deal with. Yeah. Um, but it, it is a challenge to make those areas um, flat. We're in a sort of tug of war between the temples, how far out and realistic we make those and uh, how well that lace is going to behave. Right. And for those of you who don't know, I have a video on YouTube where I share a product called Lace Stick by Wig Guru. Mm -hmm. It's a... Cute. It's a, it's a water soluble adhesive. So it's not a super, super strong adhesive. It's strong enough, but if you're looking to wear it for days, it's not going to do that because it's water soluble, but it comes in a little, it looks like a pen and you twist the bottom and the adhesive comes out on the little tip. And I will just put it like on the sides here where it doesn't want to lay flat. I don't have to put it on the, the entire lace. What I like about it is it's easy to use and it's really easy to remove and it's portable. So you can put it in your purse or in your pocket. And if your lace were to lift throughout the day, you can just touch it up. It's just fabulous. And a wig sister made it. She's the one who developed it. So that's wonderful. These yeah. temporary ad adhesives have been game changing to the yes. wig. Things like liquid yeah. gold. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, really great. I used It Stays for the first three years of my wig wearing journey because oh it was so easy to roll on and I it worked fine. If I got sweaty, it would release, but I yeah, knew yeah. that my wig wasn't going to move. And as long as once I cooled off, it re-adhered itself. But mm -hmm. I love that you just had to use a washcloth with water to yeah. remove it. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, I, I forgot all about that problem. I mean, that product. I, I remember that product from years ago. Uh, so, yes, that's great. Yeah. Well, let me look in quick. And by the way, I want to mention it again. If you're on Instagram... Instagram is really funny with the program I'm using. I have to have it on another screen. I might miss your questions. Also, we're really small on your screen over on Instagram. So if you want to come over to YouTube, just search Denise Sheets on YouTube. We're on YouTube right now, and it will be a better viewing experience for you. And I might not miss your question because I have a big screen over here. Yeah. I just saw one, though. Denise, please ask Jason what he thinks of double knots on a closure. Oh, that's a good question. So we like double knots because they don't shed as well. And so um, for a medical wig, I found the best balance is to do the hairline, which is the first half inch in single knots. Um, and when I say single knots, I'm not talking about a number of hairs. It's a, it's a number of times we tie the knot. So you could do a single knot with three hairs if you wanted to. Single, knot, single knots in the hairline, but then everything else in the wig, double knots to prevent shedding. So, um, but they are more conspicuous. Uh, it becomes more important that we try to catch only one hair or two hairs at the most when we do double knots, because then it's like extra conspicuous when you get into, right. when you get into double knots. But um, if I was going to make a closure for someone or I was going to make uh, a lace topper, um, I would do this, do that. I would use single knots in the hairline if it had a hairline and I would do double knots everywhere else just for the, now, if this was not a medical wig, if this was just like a special occasion wig, then I would do the whole thing in single knots because those are l less conspicuous. And less pressure on them if you're only wearing them occasionally. Yeah. It, it would be cheaper because double knots take longer and, um, and single knots just look better. Awesome. All right. So I think I got all the questions on Instagram. If I missed it, ask it again. I did scroll up. I want to say two compliments to you, Jason. Scarlett O'Hare. So our Yay. friend Tara, you're the only person she'll let touch her wigs. So she's very <laughs> grateful. And Alan Judge, I feel proud to call this man a friend. I would recommend yeah. the book to anyone wanting to learn more about what goes into wig, into making wearing wigs. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate that. Yeah. So 
Alan is actually a wig maker who's featured in the book. There's a picture of some curls that he did in a synthetic wig. So I that, remember that. that beautiful wavy uh, yeah. wig. And that was a, I was trying to show you, look what you can do with steam. And so that's an Alan wig. Yeah, I, re I recognize the name. So very cool. Thanks for joining, yeah. Alan. All right, so we have a couple more questions. I know you want to teach us a little something, but let's get sure. through some of these sure. questions. Um, how far away from the actual hairline do you cut the lace? When I do a refronting, or are you talking about trimming? Probably practice? she's talking about trimming. I I like as a as a rule, uh, as like as a guideline, I like to stay about a fourth of an inch away from the hairline. Now, some people aren't comfortable with that; they want to get a little closer. The more you leave, the more you have left to cut off later, because even coated lace is going to fray over time. And you don't, we don't want a frayed edge because a frayed edge won't lay flat against our skin as, as well. So as your lace frays, you're going to be inspecting it and you're going to be snipping off that frayed edge, just the frayed edge. I always put on like heavy duty reading glasses because I don't want to trim any more than I have to. But if you cut off your lace all the way up to the hairline on day one, you don't have anything else to cut off later. So, and, and I understand that if the lace is really thick or if the lace is just a completely wrong color, color for you, then I understand wanting to cut it off all the way up to the hairline. But if you can get away with leaving some, a fourth of an inch is, is pretty the standard. Um, that, that would be amazing. But if, yeah. it, if you just leave an eighth of an inch, that's something for you to trim off later. Sure. And I find if the lace is too dark and and that can happen on more budget wigs yeah. i tend to just scallop those edges and then use adhesive you know yeah. i think there's always trade-off you know if you yeah. want if you don't yeah. want to use an adhesive i think your options are a little bit more limited in what you can do about that so yeah. i think scalloped edges help a lot but they're trade-offs and drawbacks to that if i was going to use an adhesive i would definitely do an irregular shape because it was it's harder to see yeah so. yep absolutely so I had another question. If one of my synthetics lace is lifting, will glue keep it down? And I have experience with this and I would say in general, yes, but it kind of depends on why it's lifting. Yes. If there's damage to it, if there's, you know, if it's lifting because it doesn't fit you, yeah. I think there's little, so what I do, I've had um, lace lift before and I would put the adhesive on and then I'd sort of pull down on the ear tabs to really get that to lay flat. The drawback to that, though, is I could be making the problem worse yeah. <laughs> because I'm pulling on, on you know, I'm, I'm stretching that a little bit. A, a lot of times that problem, if it if it never laid flat on day one, it's because the angle that the lace was. You, we've all seen these wigs for advertising. It's like on a mannequin and the lace is like sticking out just like this. Right. You're like that's never going to lay flat on somebody's forehead. So um, if it's just a little bit, there is a way that a wig maker can pull the lace back just a little bit and restitch it to the um, ear tab. There'll be a little fold there that you might feel when you put on the wig, but but it's not much of a big deal. Uh, if it's a lot, then that trick won't work because we'll create these sort of wrinkles when we pull it back. But um, but a little bit can be, that's a really easy repair. Yeah. And honestly, I had a wig that I had to cut bangs into it because I just couldn't get the lace to lay flat. So yeah. I cut bangs into yeah. it. <laughs> that's Sometimes you have to do that. Um, yeah. I've seen a few, I don't do this procedure, but I've seen people put darts in the lace. Um, you would have to cover that up with your hair because right. the darts would show. But I have seen wig makers and even uh, and clients do that. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I had someone ask what you do. I missed it. It was something about a warped monofilament top. Is there any way to fix a warp warped monofilament top. Now monofilament is usually something that's behind the hairline. So there's usually monofilament and then lace. I've never seen an issue with the monofilament be warped or wrinkled. I'm not sure. Um, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know how to speak to that. So yeah. If you're on Instagram, you can always message message him a picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm volunteering your time. <laughs> if you if you've if you've made the mistake of messaging me, you know I like to talk. So. Yes. Get ready for it's wonderful a book. though. It's yeah. always good information. Somebody messaged me at work. I was I, I do nursing too. If somebody messaged me at work, just some simple question. And I must have sent them three paragraphs. And it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I sent you a book, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. So you must have helped. I don't know who this is. Her name here on YouTube is L. R. Wagner. You must have helped her with the twill tape and the blocking. She said. Her fingers are crossed. It's pinned right now. Yes, that was, uh, I know who that is. Yes, yes. Well, she was just messaging me. And so um, 
we're we're hoping that 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 we can avoid an expensive repair for her by damp blocking. We'll see. Yeah. Well, I'm crossing my fingers too. Yes. So uh, someone asked earlier, and I just see someone is trying to answer about softening the lace. So on some <laughs> wigs, the lace is really scratchy Great and boy. not very comfortable. Yeah. And so I see some people saying, can you use fabric softener on it? I think that could loosen the knots. I've never, I've never done that before. I've never heard of softening lace before. I will say that the thicker the lace is, the more prickly it usually is. There is a coated lace. I've never used it. There's a coated lace called silk coated lace that's uh, made by uh, a lace manufacturer, Atelier, Atelier Bossy. And I don't know what's on that lace, but it, feels like velvet. It's so interesting. And it's not it, not for anybody who uses adhesives like um, wig glue because sure. the solvents are not good for whatever that coating is, but it, but it feels amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't heard of anything because it's basically it's plastic or whatever yeah. it's made out of. And I just haven't heard of anything. I've heard of people putting like medical tape over it, but then you can't use it as lace. Right. You kind of have to cut bangs. You'll be able to see that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you were going to educate us on something and it went yeah, out of my head. I'll teach you how to do something from the book. Um, yes, please since do. Since we're talking about repairs, I thought maybe I'd teach you. Yeah. Um, Before we get there, let me just announce, I am doing a giveaway for five of his wig life books. Jason donated a few and a wig sister donated a few. Thank and you. we're going five books the giveaway is in the description of the YouTube video. So there's a link to uh, Sweep Widget. That's a, just a, a platform I use to do giveaways. It makes it a lot easier for me. I don't have to go through all the comments and then I can just randomly pick. Yeah. So if you're on Instagram, if you're on Facebook, you do have to go over to the YouTube video to get that link. This video will be posted for replay and the giveaway is open until... Friday at midnight. So I will draw a winner on Saturday. So there'll be plenty of time for people to watch the replay and be able to register for the giveaway. That's exciting. Um, real quick, speaking of Instagram, if anybody ever has any trouble ordering the book and you want a copy, if you have any trouble, just message me. Blurb has been, Blurb is the publisher. They've been wonderful, but there's sometimes a little glitch that's usually associated with Instagram, but it, I know how to fix it. So you just message me. Awesome. Thank you for that. All right. So let's talk about what you're going to teach us from the book. Oh, yeah, sure. So since we're talking about repairs and restorations and things, um, at the end of chapter five, the cleaning chapter, I teach you how to do something called a, for human hair, I call it a deep conditioning hot oil treatment, but it's very restorative for hair that's just getting frizzy and tangly. And then there's a synthetic hair version that is um, very restorative. It, like if somebody sends me a synthetic wig that's like, this is just so dry and frizzy, the first thing I do is this restoration treatment. So I'm going to teach you how to do it. It's not, not very hard. So we're going to need a few things. You're going to need a big bowl and you're going to need some oven bags. We're not going to put a wig in the oven, but you need an oven bag for this. You're going to need um, a source of hot water. So I have like a hot water kettle in my studio where I can quickly boil some water. You're going to need some hot water. Um, what the temperature is going to depend on a few things. We're going to talk about that. And then you're going to need a couple of products for human hair. You're going to want some virgin coconut oil. Now I say virgin coconut oil is solid at room temperature, which is annoying because you're going to have to take a spoonful of it, put it in a little bowl and melt it in the microwave. And so people ask me all the time, well, can I just use the coconut oil that's liquid at room temperature? Well, the, the one that's liquid at room temperature, they've taken something out that we really want. There's a fatty acid in coconut oil called lauric acid that loves to stick to the protein bonds of hair. And that is so great for damaged hair, um, especially your blondes who have just been bleached to filth. Um, there, the liquid coconut oil doesn't have nearly as much lauric acid in it. So get the kind that's solid. We're going to melt. We're only going to need a little bit. And, um, and you're going to need a conditioner. So I usually do this with silicone mix bamboo. Um, there's a version of silicone mix that's the original, which is called silicone mix. And it's a little heavy. And, um, and most people don't like how it smells. Um, but silicone mix bamboo is a little lighter and it smells nice. So you, so that is the conditioner that I typically use with this procedure, whether it's synthetic or human. Um, but you, for your human hair wig, you could be really selective with which conditioner you use for this treatment. So for example, um, let's say the wig 
was low in protein. I teach you how to test a wig for needing protein in wig life. I teach you how to do some tests to see if your wig needs protein. Well, if you have that kind of wig, maybe for this procedure, you'll want to use a, a conditioner that's got protein in it. Or maybe your wig is very tangly. And so there's great detangling conditioners. Do you guys remember the Paul Mitchell detangling conditioner yes. called The yeah. Detangler? I still love that. <laughs> So you could use that. So for your human hair, um, the ratio of products, you're going to mix up one third cup of your conditioner and a fourth of a teaspoon of your melted um, coconut oil. So not very much. If you use more coconut oil than a fourth of a teaspoon, your wig will be greasy. So don't, don't get crazy with the coconut oil. A fourth of a teaspoon of coconut oil and a third a cup of conditioner. Mix that up really well. If this is a big wig, you probably have to double all of that. So um, with the synthetic, the, the uh, ingredients are a little different. Um, yes, yes to silicone mixed bamboo. There, I don't know why sil uh, synthetic hair likes silicone mix, but I, that's not an original idea. If you go look on YouTube, you'll see lots of people putting silicone mix on synthetic wigs, even though it's made for human hair. Um, but instead of coconut oil, you're going to use fabric softener. You're going to use downy fabric softener. So you're going to mix up a third a cup of your silicone mix bamboo and this time it's a half a teaspoon of, of um, fabric softener. The ratio with these two isn't so imperative. So if you were to go in extra fabric softener, it wouldn't matter like it does with the human hair. But I did a big test where I had like a table full of samples of really fried synthetic hair. And I found that that ratio was the best. So, um, so you mix up that. You're going to put that put that mixture all over your wig. Try not to put it on the knots, but if a little bit gets on the knots, it's not the end of the world. We talked about that. Yes, um, so really go in there and, and don't be sparing. Put lots of product on the wig. Put that into your oven bag. Put your wig into the oven bag. Uh, tie, it, tie it closed. Try to get as much air out of it as you can. Tie it closed. And then you're going to put that down into your bowl. Now, if this is human hair, you're going to pour boiling water into the bowl and just let that sit there for an hour. If it floats, don't worry about it, it's okay. Just put enough water in to cover the bag and if it floats, don't worry about it. If this is synthetic, the temperature of the wig, we have to think about that. If you don't care about the curl pattern, if you don't care about preserving some kind of curl pattern and this is an HD synthetic hair, you could use, then use boiling water, then use okay. boiling water. If you care about the um, curl pattern, then maybe use hot water, not boiling water. So, um, and your regular synthetics, not the HD synthetics, definitely don't use the boiling water for them. Um, use, use, just use um, hot water. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's how you do that. You leave it for an hour and then get it out. And then we got to rinse this product off. Now, last time we um, we talked, I taught you how to rinse using the pitcher method. So right. turning the wig side out and using a pitcher method. There's going to be so much product on this wig that the pitcher method is just going to be too time consuming. So what I do if I do this is I turn the wig inside out um, and rinse it under the faucet with the water turned half strength. So not full blast because that's not great for our knots. Right. Um, turn the wig water, cold water, half strength. And with the wig inside out, rinse it off. Um, and we talked about why turning it inside out. If we if we rinse, if we send water through the lace from the outside of the wig to the inside, we can create wash through. We can push hair through the lace, and we don't want to do that. So that is a great um, restoration treatment for human hair or synthetic. Um, you you'll find that your, your uh, human hair can get um, a little frizzy or, or stiff or um, tangly. And this is great for that. Sometimes though, the reason that your hair is getting stiff and tangly and frizzy is product buildup. So just to take that out of the equation, make sure that's not the problem. You might want to wash the wig with a clarifying shampoo before you do this, just to make sure that that's not the problem. So great I'll, idea. So anytime I do this procedure, I first, you need to wash the wig first, get it clean, but I use a clarifying shampoo in case what we're seeing is product buildup. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people mention undo goo. Is that I've never, clarifying? I've never used that one. I use okay. the Kenra, the Kenra clarifying the Kenra? shampoo. Okay, great. There's so many good, good ones out there. Yeah. What chapter was this in, by the way? That is the last two procedures in the end of Chapter five. Okay. Chapter, Chapter five, five, everyone. So obviously this was too quick for you to really get it all. But the point I think is 
to reinforce if you already have the book, but to also let you know that this book is going to teach you something very valuable in caring for your wigs. If all it does is help you prolong the life of a wig. It's worth it, in my yeah. opinion. That's probably what the most of the material is. I did. We didn't talk about this last time, but I did put in some consumer information, like how to look at a wig critically that you're thinking about buying it, how to what questions you should ask before you buy it, what to look at once you've got it and you've got it in the grace period. I kind of did in the appendix a sort of head to toe assessment of a wig with like I think it was like 27 questions you might yeah. ask. Yep. It's, it's very nursing kind of a way of looking at things, a head to toe assessment. Um, but that should be helpful to anybody who's, yes. who's buying a wig and they're like, I'm not sure if this is worth the money I'm spending it. You know, I mean, you even taught how to test whether it's Remy hair or not. So yeah, yeah. I think there is a lot of good information in there. Yeah. So we have a question, Debbie, what can you do if you are losing hair on a silk top? Ooh, that is a very difficult repair. It requires a special needle to add um, I did, I, you, you may look at one. I did a repair like that on my Instagram, on the pristine postiche Instagram. And you can, I took some pictures. It's like a surgery. Um, I can do that if it's a very small area, if it's like global shedding, it's just, it, it's, it would, would take months to do that because it's like double, um, hand tying is, is time consuming, but when you're fixing silk tops, you're hand tying hair onto lace on the inside of the wig. And then when you've done that, you have to take a needle and pull every hair through the silk one hair at a time. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh my gosh. It is murder. Um, and to do that amongst other hair that's already yeah. there, it's just crazy. Yeah. But if it's a small area, like maybe the size of a dime, then that would be worth fixing. And that's something that I can do. Awesome. I'm glad I don't like silk tops then. <laughs> I just find them heavy and hot, but <laughs> yeah, there is something called a French silk top. That's not as hot that um, okay. I'm, I'm hoping that my manufacturer can do those for me. Great. Can you see the comment I just put on the screen? Oh yeah. Hey, Hey classy. Nice to meet you. Classy sassy. I just did. I've never used that option for this before. So I thought I would give it a oh. shot, but since you can't see I all saw of the it. comments. Yeah. That's yeah, neat. we've oh, got quite a few compliments. I've been uh, so honored and blessed by all the people I've met since this book come out. I've had such wonderful conversations. Yeah, it's just this community is something else. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, Jason was the first place that I heard that you shouldn't use T-pins. All over the internet, they're telling you to use T-pins to put your wig into a block. And no, no, no. I used T-pins years and years ago. It's like this we've we've evolved and we've learned new things. So yeah, it is wonderful. So what temperature is considered hot? Oh, mm, that's a good question. Like, like you would get you would take a bath in it. That kind of hot. That's what I would do. Now, um, if you're trying to preserve a curl pattern, every every HD every fabric fiber is a little different. So some HD fibers would lose a curl pattern even with hot water. You might want to do a little strand test. Yeah. Any other questions? Please ask them again if I miss them. I want to make sure we're getting all of your questions. Don't forget there is a giveaway going on. Um, we are giving away five of Jason's wonderful books. Yeah. And the details for the giveaway are in the description of the YouTube video. And there is a link. Please don't be scammed, you guys. There's so many scammers. Whenever there's a giveaway, they come out, they... In the comments, they make comments trying to trick you into going to another website thinking it's me. The only way that the giveaway is being held is through Sweep Widget, and you will not be required to pay a cent, not even for shipping. So if anybody is ever saying you won something and they're trying to collect money from you, that is not a giveaway that I'm hosting. I will never collect money from you. It's uh, too bad that you, I have to say that. <laughs> I just thought of another simple repair that people could do for themselves. That's really easy. It's in chapter six. Um, and that is a way to tighten knots. Uh, it's super easy. Like if you want, if you want me to teach that, um, if, yeah. you want, if you're, if you have single knots in the hairline and those are, those are the ones that look the best, they can get, they can loosen up and then they'll be more conspicuous. The knot will look bigger when it's loosened up. There's a really easy way to um, tighten them up. That's pretty gentle. You need to pin down the wig pretty securely. Um, you don't um, have to put in twill tape for this, but that would probably be better. Moisten up the hair with a spray bottle and then take a soft bristle brush and, and brush the hair back 
that will have a tightening effect. It will gently pull on the hair, which will tighten up some of those knots. It won't tighten every knot. This only works, I would say this works moderately well, but it's so easy. Why not do it? Why not do it? So if I want to, if when I'm looking at someone's wig and I'm looking at the hairline and I say, oh, these, these, these knots need to be tightened up before I do anything else, I'll do that first. And then I'll go on to do something a little more advanced to tighten up what didn't work, what didn't tighten from that. But that's super easy. That sounds great. So you said chapter six on that one. Yes, that is. In, yeah, that's in chapter six. Great. As you guys can tell, there's so much in this book. So Kathy has asked, let me actually put it on the screen. Hey, Kathy. As far as clarifying shampoo, do you mean wig clarifying or human hair clarifying? I honestly use the same um, clarifying shampoo for both synthetic and human. It's the I use the Kenra because I find that with synthetic fibers, they don't they don't care which shampoo you use. Um, and this clarifying is like a strong shampoo. So if it's going to pull off product off human hair, it'll pull off product off synthetic fibers as well. And when we get into conditioners, it's, it's a little different whenever we get into conditioners. But for clarifying shampoo, I use the same one for synthetic or human hair. That's great to know. I, um, I'm i making notes of some of the products Jason has mentioned. I'll go find them online and I'll put them in the description of this video. So if you want to come back later, I'll make sure all of those links are in the description so you don't have to try to search for them or remember what he said. <laughs> One day I'll have an Amazon list. I tried to get that and they said, you don't qualify. And so I, it took me a long time to get an Amazon. I guess I, have, I guess I need to be more popular. That's right. <laughs> I don't know. That's the problem. It's all for helping people and these companies won't let us help. <laughs> yeah. there, uh, there's so many products mentioned in, um, in uh, wig life. Yeah. Yeah. It's really wonderful. Another question. Marsha asked, is there a repair for lace that is fraying into the hairline? Okay, so once we've gotten to the point where the lace is fraying into the hairline, I would probably go in, just to give the wig a little bit longer life, I would go in with a fray blocking, what's called a fabric, there's an acronym, fabric fray sealant. It's only something that I would do once the lace is already to that last stage of its life. And so there's the one that I like is called um, Fray Check by Dritz. Yep. And I, and I teach you how to put in, in wig life a really thin coat of that. I would only go about a fourth of an inch back. And the reason that I say wait until this very last stage of the lace's life when it's all the way to the hairline is because products like that, they're not made for wigs. They're made for fabric. And they can change colors over time. I've seen them turn milky. I've seen them um, turn, I had one turn blue once. It, I, I exposed it to a solvent, a wig glue solvent, it turned blue. So I had to put in a whole new front end on that wig for free. Um, but but then when that stops working, then you'll need a refronting. You'll need a new panel of lace put in like I did for Miss Denise's wig. Yeah. So there's other repairs that we haven't talked about that can be done on a wig besides refronting. We could, we could go through some of those as well. Yeah. If you want to sort of mention them so people can yeah. get an idea of what it is that they might reach out for even. Sure. sure. So something, um, uh, something similar to a refronting is called, it's named after the wig maker who made it popular, Atoria Demps, where we don't replace the lace. You still have good lace. We're gonna. This would only work on a human hair wig. You chemically remove the hairline and then put in a new hairline. So that doesn't that doesn't require any sewing. So it's faster and easier than a refronting. But you have to the lace that you have is is still good. And that's it's easier for us to do that if you have not trimmed the lace yet. So say you bought a wig and you hate the hairline, you could have a Toria Demps procedure put on where we just replace the hairline and give you a nice fancy new hairline. That's a repair. You saw um, patching holes is pretty common. Um, I had a lady who had a wig who was like super tangly. And so what that usually means is um, we need to remove a little bit of the cuticle. The, the outer layer of the hair is just, just uh, not wanting to lay flat. And so there's a, that's a chemical process. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to dip the wig into some, some, crazy chemicals and wear a gas mask. Um, and then we like to follow that up with a, with a new coat of silicone. Um, we talked a little bit about silicone coatings last time. Um, those two together, so cuticle, uh, cuticle reduction and silicone bonding is great for a wig that just like will not stop tangling. Um, so that's really good. Let's see, I wrote down some things. Oh, an HD part is fun. Um, say 
you know where you want to part the wig, but the knots are just like really conspicuous. They're really big and ugly. You can have the the that section of the wig can be chemically removed and put in a new hair, new um, parting. And that's called an HD part. Um, so when we would do that, we just like one hair at a time so that when it, the hair is parted, it'll look nice and you won't see any knots. That's called an HD part. Let's see, what else did I write down? Um, Protein treatments. You can do a protein treatment yourself, but that's something that sometimes I get asked to do. Um, dip dip dyeing lace. So if your lace is too light, um, and this would be for people who are very dark skin or medium uh, complected individuals and your, your lace is too light, most lace can be dip dyed. Um, and it's the only way you can dye lace when there's already hair in the situation because dip dyeing doesn't require any heat. Now some lace requires heat to absorb dye and that kind of that kind of wig would not be a candidate for this, but to darken lace sometimes you can you can have the lace dyed um, by a wig maker. And so that's nice for somebody who has dark skin. Let's see. Um, Can you do that? Do you dye lace? I, I, I have just switched to a new kind of lace. So I haven't moved all my recipes over. I, like, I like used to, I have like a ton of recipes for like all these different skin complexions, whether you're summer or autumn, and I would send you samples. I'm working on translating all those, those dye recipes to the kind of lace I use now. Okay. So that's going to be a bit of a project. And, yeah. And then... I think the other most common procedure I get asked to do is uh, decreasing the circumference of a wig. The wig is too big. The wig is too big. And there seems to be a real shortage of extra small wigs. So it's not uncommon for somebody to buy a small wig who needs an extra small. And then they'll have the circumference um, taken in. So that's that's another surgery. That's more another one of the more expensive um, repairs. But we're making darts in the wig here and tightening up the elastic bands. Um, but that can be done. You can you can decrease the circumference of a wig by a whole size if you if you need to. How about increasing? I get asked all the time. We have I have lots of wig sisters with big head measurements and just yeah. can't find wigs that'll fit. I've never I've never done it before on a medical wig. And when I say medical wigs, I mean something with an adjustable band apparatus. Um, I've done it on a lace wig. That's pretty. You just add more lace in, in mm -hmm. the form of a dart. But on a medical wig, I've not done it. If you want to be a guinea pig and let me do it, I'll charge you half of what I would normally charge per hour, and you could be you could be the guinea pig. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Jump on it. Um, somebody asked where she can buy the book. I put a link to the book in the description while Jason was talking. So if you're on YouTube, just go to the description, and the link to the book is in there now. And and the last you might time, have to refresh though because if you're in it not right now it's not live real time you'd have to refresh your screen to get it. And also, I had decreased the the cost to fifty dollars for the paperback, and I just after, when, when we did the last live, and I just left that there. I just left it at fifty dollars, so it's still at that reduced price. That's awesome. That's so kind of you. So let me see. Do we have any other questions? Was that all? Oh, somebody asked: Is ventilating expensive? Yeah. Um. It's very time consuming. Um, so I just I just look at the area and and measure and I can kind of ball ballpark how long this is going to take me and what what kind of knots we're going to use has has a factor as well. So if this is behind the hairline, we're going to be doing double knots. And so that's going to take a little longer. Um, so, yeah, it, it is. Expensive. So oh, here's a better question. Here's a better answer to that question. If you've got shedding in a wig and it's just one spot, like maybe some hair got snatched out or maybe you've been guilty of doing this and you've created some shedding in that area. That's not too hard to fix if it's global shedding. So like a little bit all over and you've got to work in and around hair. That's all. That's very time consuming. So that can be very expensive. Yeah. So Alan asked me to have you explain the difference in qualities between the likes of Chinese hair, Indian hair, Russian hair. Oh, okay. That, that's nice. That'll be fun. Okay. So there's the three different kinds of hair that is normally used in a wig is um, there's Asian hair. And I say Asian because 
that covers Chinese, that covers Southeast Asian, all of those. Um, there's a reason I've been learning to speak Vietnamese lately. I've been doing Duolingo to learn Vietnamese. Wow. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Um, so we'll get your nails done and understand what they're saying. <laughs> no, no telling. Um, and then there's Indian hair is the other more common hair that you see put into um, wigs. And then there's European. So there's pros and cons to all three. Um, and I just want to interrupt real quick. Yeah, he yeah. does talk about that in this book a little bit. I took all these notes about <laughs> all the different, he does talk about it. So again, another thing in the book. Asian is wonderful because it can really take a beating. So if we're bleaching this down to blonde, then your Asian hair is great. The big difference between the three different types is the diameter of the hair. So Asian hair has the biggest diameter. And so they use the word coarse to describe that. But I hate that word because coarse sounds like it's it's dull and, and doesn't feel nice. But some Chinese hair is just silky, shiny. It's like gorgeous. Um, it tends to hang a little heavier. So remember Marsha Brady and her hair flopping back and forth? That's what I think of when I make a wig out of Asian hair because it hangs heavier. Uh, the downside is our knots are going to be bigger because the hairs are bigger. So our knots are going to be bigger um, when we tie those knots. So that uh, can annoy some people. And some Asian hair can hang a little too straight. It can be sort of like poker straight. And then so like you, you're going to have to go in with a curling iron on a regular basis to give it a little bit of wave if you want that. Mm. So that's Asian hair. And it is the least expensive to use in the wig to make a wig. Indian hair is much closer to the diameter of, of European hair. It's much smaller diameter. Um, it can be a little fragile to work with as far as chemical processing. I don't know if I'll ever do blondes in Indian hair. We'll see. I'm working on um, hair processing as we speak. Um, but it's it's softer. It's fluffier. Um, you know, it nev it's never perfectly straight. If I, I order straight Indian hair, it's going to have some wave. It's going to have a little bit of a wave. So that's nice. But um, it's just a softer. And the knots are super tiny with Indian hair. So that's really nice. <clears throat> um, but it can be it can be a little fragile as far as chemical processing. And then there's European hair, which is it's hair grown on a Caucasian. So when you hear um, wigs being made out of Slavic hair, that's European hair. That's that, and, and the main place that European hair is purchased for to make wigs is Russia and the Ukraine, which has been a mess. What's right? going on? I'm sure that's really difficult. So, so I can't even really make um, wigs out of European hair right now without them costing an absolute fortune. The, the nice thing about European hair is uh, it's already grown in every color you can possibly think of. So you could have, you can have virgin hair in a European wig. If you wanted a red haired wig that was virgin hair, it would have to be European hair. There is a reason. Deborah, I think he's referring to sub uh, native. So she said Indian hair, subcontinent or native. I'm sure she's wondering if you're talking about American Indian or. Not American Indian. Although I would love to make a wig out of American Indian hair just to see what it, what it feels like. Um, but uh, yeah, India, uh, uh, in, uh, Indian hair from India. Yes, there. It's much smaller diameter, and so it's very soft. Um, oh, there is a cause sometimes to dye European hair. Some I, as a wig maker, I used to think, why would you ever dye European hair? The whole point is to have it virgin. But sometimes a client has a very specific color and texture that they're reaching for, and so it may be that I can find the texture in European hair, but I can't find the color. So we'll go in and dye it. But you really have to trust who's doing that. That this is European hair because you're going to be paying more for it. But there's there's opportunity to deceive people with that because I can find Indian hair that feels just like European hair, the, the super good quality. Like you could close your eyes and feel it, and you would this is you would think this was Caucasian hair. Um, not all Indian hair is like that. You have this the premium, but that that lends itself to opportunities to um, say something that's European that really is not. Right, which I think. I think it happens a lot. And I think in, in many cases, the retailer doesn't even really know. They've put their trust in yeah. their vendor. And yeah. and so, but I also have heard people, customers, how do I say this? I think there's, a, because there is a lot of dishonesty in the world, a lot of people assume everyone's being dishonest. Oh. And so I think we should 
be a little careful too, that we're not saying there's no way that's European hair to someone when we really don't know firsthand. Because I hear that as well. And it's like, oh, well, I mean, at some point you have to choose to trust someone or you don't trust them. Yeah, it's the relationship with the vendor or the wig maker. It would be the key with that. Yeah. Hmm. Question about European. What is European denier? Oh, that's a good question. I don't, I wish I had a book in my hand right now. I could tell you. Um, I denier, knew, you know where it was? Not, it's not in my book. It's like a textbook. Oh, but I see. Denier refers to the diameter of the hair. So in general, like I said, Asian hair has a bigger denier or bigger diameter. Um Indian is in the middle, and then European hair is usually considered the lowest in your, but that's a good question because that is not necessarily true. Some European hair is quite coarse. I used to have beautiful, coarse red hair that if you were to look at under a microscope, I'm sure the diameter would have been every bit as big as Asian hair. European hair comes in lots of, of variety. So, but when someone asks for when someone is adamant that they want European hair, usually what they're reaching for is the very soft, feathery soft, the diameter is very small type of European hair. It can even be too soft. I made, I made a hair system for a guy last year and he didn't have a ton of money to spend. And I just happened to have some hair, the European hair. And I warned him, this is very soft. Like this almost feels like children's hair. And when he got it, he actually didn't like it because it was it was like it's too soft. Yes. So that is a risk with your yeah. <clears throat> so tell me if I'm wrong here. I just recently reviewed a wig by Ellen Villa, which is a major name brand that generally synthetic hair, but they do have some human hair. And it was a brand new Remy human hair piece. It was like $3,500 retail, which I didn't, it wasn't my wig. I was just on loan, the most yeah. expensive wig I've ever had. But the hair was so incredible and it was just sleek and straight. Yeah. And so I'm assuming that was probably Chinese hair. Or and I just, Asian. yeah. Yeah. And I, and so I, I, I wonder, like, for somebody who loves super sleek, super straight hair, they don't really like to curl the hair, but they're tired of working so hard with product and a flat iron and all of that. Would they be looking for Asian hair then? Asian hair would be there that, for that sleek. Look, by the way, that, that your Danity wig, I'm I'm 99% sure that's Indian hair. Just because well, I'm looking at it under She oh. said um, it's yeah. actually Filipino hair and she oh, sourced wow. it herself. Marvelous. I've never yeah. worked with, I've never no, worked with. No, it was her first time as well. And the curl, I mean, this is Beautiful. like natural. I It needs to be redone. I've worn it a number of times so far, so I need to refresh it, but it gets really curly and it's natural. Oh, and we, we coated that with some silicone too. Yeah. And I saw more curl come back when I did that. So that yeah. Was cool. yeah, it's just amazing. So I yeah. saw another question. What hair is used on the cheaper Amazon real hair wigs? Ooh, that's a good question. The really cheap stuff. What yeah. To make a wig out of human hair really cheaply is they'll use non-Remy hair. So non-Remy has to do with how the hair is harvested. So if you cut a, wig, a lock of hair off someone's ponytail, all the cuticles are going in the same direction. All those shingles, they look like shingles on a roof. They're all pointing in the right direction. And you could make a wig out of that without doing anything chemically to it if you if you wanted to. Um, but if the hair was gathered in such a way, like off the floor of a barber shop, where we have a mismatch, we have some hairs going one way and some hairs going the other. And so the cuticles are going in wrong directions. We cannot make a wig that way without doing something to those cuticles. They would it would create the biggest knot of tangles you've ever seen because with cuticles going in different directions, they'll lock together like Velcro. It's a mess. So that hair is cheaper to harvest because it's literally just gathered up off the floor. But, and then it's, then it has its cuticle removed with a chemical process. Cuticle deletion is the name of the process. Um, and it, that has an impact on the health of the hair. It has to it usually needs to sil a silicone coating to make it last, but sometimes they don't bother to even do that. And that's how you really get into some really cheap Amazon wigs. So that's, that's what that is. It's, it's non-rimmy hair that's had its cuticle removed and that's a cheaper way to make wigs. 
Yeah. And I have a video on YouTube. If you search Denise Sheets yeah. Remy, where I talk about Remy hair and I have a lot of visuals. So in case you've never heard of it before, that whole shingle thing, it's really helpful to learn about the visuals. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody asked, is white platinum hair color, is white platinum, let me just put it up here because I'm not reading it right. Is white platinum color human hair rare? It is in, in its virgin state. Like for if I was to try to buy virgin platinum European hair, it would, my God, that would be a fortune. I've never done it. That's why it's how, how expensive it is. It would be easier to, if I, if somebody was like, I need a, a platinum wig, um, I would, I would, it would, I would start with Asian hair because, and then I would bleach it in stages. So bleach it down to level five and then the next stage, bleach it down to level eight. We would do it in stages. Um, but in human hair in Europe, which means, which would be European hair. It's yes, it's, it's kind of hard to get. Yeah. Would you say that 80% of the hair in the wig market is dark brown, like, or higher? Like what percentage of the hair that is available for wigs on the market when you go to buy hair? When, as a wig maker, I have hair vendors. I have a guy in India that I love, and um, and I have a couple of people in um, in in Southeast Asia. I like Vietnamese hair as far as Asian, because it's not as straight as Chinese, and so it just makes a prettier wig to me. And so <clears throat> I have dreams of having my own factory one day in Vietnam. <clears throat> so um, I see. Well, the question was. Just, buy, would you say like 80% or more of the hair available is dark brown? So therefore any of the blondes, any of the reds, it's very highly processed. Yeah, I would say not even brown. I would say jet black. Okay. When I buy Asian hair and Indian hair, it's black. The Indian is a little lighter. And once in a while, you have a lock that has this sort of number three, I call it espresso. It's like a, a warm dark brown, like hot chocolate. And that's kind of like, oh, I got a unicorn. But most of the time it's jet black. Yeah. Which is why um, I've talked about this in videos before. If you are a blonde or a redhead and you're looking for, and I know Sarah can relate to this, if you're looking for um, those colors of human hair wigs, you have to expect that those wigs have gone through so much processing that your care of them is going to be even more important than yeah. maybe somebody who wears dark brown hair because while while we should care for our wigs all of them your wigs have gone through some special effort to get there yeah the lighter the color the more you can just know that the more damage it had to be on its way to that color and some factories and manufacturers are better at that than others yeah all right one compliment for you Thank from you. Lisa. Hey, Miss Lisa. It's good to see All you. All right, friends, we've been talking for an hour and 12 minutes, and I think you guys are saints for hanging out with us this oh, long. No. <laughs> I hope we got through the most important questions that you had. I have been trying to watch, but if we missed it, please let me know. We can always do another live sometime in the future. I love talking to you, Jason. You're just so wonderful, and it's so, so fun. Much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. I, yeah. you know, I love to run my mouth. <laughs> well, and you know what? You've got some good stuff to say. So I'm here for it. I think all of us are. The compliments that I get about you are off the charts. So you are doing something very special in this community and you're making a difference. I want you to know that. And I know it's important too because you're a nurse. <laughs> people don't go into nursing unless they really want to make a difference and help people. And you're doing that here in the wig world. Oh, and that's why I say if you send a repair to me and definitely, you know, I'm up for repairs, be patient with me because I am juggling. I am juggling nursing with this. Yeah. So. so how can people reach you if they're not on Instagram? Oh, um, my email is pristinepostiche at gmail.com. I'll put email. that in the description of this video so people can know how to spell it. <laughs> yes, that's what I like. It used to be when I first started pristine prosthesis. I like the double P's, but people thought I was making wooden legs. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit different than that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, let me just double check that I didn't miss one final question. I think that's it. Everybody's okay. grateful, Jason. Thank that you so much. Fun. It oh, was so nice. fun. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for watching. Bye. Come back and, and look at all the links that I'm going to add to this video um, later. And don't forget to register for the giveaway to win one of five of these wonderful books. Exciting. Good night. Good night. <laughs>